And the church said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, my brother, for that good song leading. Thank you, church, for that good singing. Y'all, y'all got better each day. Maybe we need to extend this meeting. Amen. Amen. They used to do it in the old days, go two extra weeks. <laughs> I have thoroughly enjoyed being here amongst you all. My brothers and sisters, thank you so much for all you ladies, for all the stuff that you've been doing and preparing, and all you men for all the cleaning and lifting chairs. Even these teenagers started. That's impressive. You're impressing me, man. <laughs> you might just be ready to come home with me now. My little brother, he didn't want me to kiss him. I got to picking up chairs and stacking them. I turned around, he's stacking chairs. I was like, man, I didn't even have to whoop him. That's good. <laughs> I know I'm growing on you. Just give me a little bit of a little bit more time. It's so good to see you all. Thank you all so much for letting me tease you young folks. And letting me peck and poke on you. Thank you, Strawberry. <laughs> I've been picking on all these young boys. If you don't pick on people, they don't miss you. Amen. Hey, man. My sisters miss me tremendously. <laughs> they don't have dolls no more, and I don't be hit no more dolls. But please keep Dewana Sue in your prayers. Dewana Sue is a sister of mine. She's the fifth daughter, right after me. And we were very, very close. But she got caught up in the drugs, cocaine, alcohol, and we haven't spoke for 53 years. My oldest sister married. She became a Christian in 1974. And we stayed in touch these past 48 years. She called me last year and she said, Dewana Sue had had a stroke. All the drugs and stuff she's taking, she's 68 years old. And she's in a nursing home. And she sent me a number. And for the first time in 53 years, we heard each other's voice and we just cried like babies. My sister told me she was giving up on life. And we've been talking every day now for the past three or four months, and it's just truly been wonderful. She's not been sober enough these last 53 years for me to speak to her, and now that she is, uh, we've gone from A to Z about growing up, and she reminded me of some things. She said, I remember us watching TV and you was watching Doris Day, and you said you was going to grow up and marry Doris Day. I don't remember that, but she did. <laughs> We've been reminiscing about our upbringing and how we survived. She said, why didn't you get me out of here? I said, I've been trying all these years. And so we, she asked me if I would study the scripture with her. Her left side is paralyzed, so she's learning how to use her phone so she can put it on speaker and turn the pages with one hand. But please, please keep her in your prayers as we begin to talk about the gospel. She's the first out of all my sisters to call and ask me to teach her. Six of them were Jehovah Witness. She was one of them. But she says she knows that they're not right. <laughs> Uh, she said that those other five sisters she knows now has not been teaching the truth. She said, you're the only one out of us 11 kids, you're the only one whose message I see in your life. In all these years, I didn't think she was watching. <laughs> so I know others have been praying and this is just a, a very emotional opportunity when you've been praying for someone for that long and uh, we're brother and sister again uh, like the lesson yesterday with you young people she had been like legion she had been shackled 
she had been separated and Satan had been destroying her. And so we talked about those S's yesterday. Sin separates, society shackles, and Satan destroys, as in Mark chapter 5. What made me have to learn my Bible is I was teaching a lot of athletes. And athletes know the one thing that they have to know is the playbook. Regardless of how fast you run, regardless of how big you are, regardless of how strong you are, if you don't know the playbook, you can't play in the game. In professional football, if you lose that playbook, it's $100,000. Can you imagine, shepherds, if we find members who are not bringing their Bibles, would the collection go up? <laughs> if you are overweight, it's $500 a pound. The third time is $3,000 a pound. And after that, they can find you your whole salary. You are bigger than they are, and they cannot, you cannot, they, these coaches know they can't hurt you. They can't whoop you. But when they start detracting zeros and numbers off a check, it gets people's attention. When we were, when I was with the Baltimore Coast my second year, we were training up in Golden, Colorado. And there's nothing in Golden, Colorado. At least there was nothing I wanted. And that's where we went for conditioning. And there is no oxygen in Golden, Colorado. I had to sit in a shower after practice almost every day for three hours, put a chair there and just <laughs> I thought they, uh, that they were trying to get rid of us. And that is one of the reasons for a training camp. If you've not been training, your body will break down in the joints. Ankles, knees, back, elbows, neck. There is no if, ands, and buts about it. The training camp is set up to expose whether you've been training. And if your body breaks down, it already told the coaches you've not been conditioning and training yourself. If you miss curfew the first time, it's, in my day, it was like $25,000. I'm sure it's more than that today. And John Mackey, some of y'all might remember, John Mackey was probably the greatest tight end ever played. John Mackey could have been president. We sit around the table and that wasn't a subject he didn't know everything about. Graduating from Syracuse. But during camp, Mackey was there, was not there for curfew. They have a curfew check each evening after your meetings. Mackey was not there and five nights in a row. And they was finding him 50,000, 100,000, 200,000. And he finally shows back up. And we're like, man, do you know how much they find you? He said, I'm a grown man. Ain't no man going to tell me when I can get together with my wife. It's like, man, this dude is bold. And we was about to break camp, and they said, oh, John, by the way, all those fines have been canceled. <laughs> Well, he was one of the best players in the NFL and starved the team. But they were trying to send the message to all them rookies. Yes, they weren't making a lot of money. Or I should say we, at that time, you could, they could, uh, the minimum was 30000 that uh, they could give you, as a lot of us had signed for. And, um, that would have been my whole paycheck. <laughs> and so it... It's a different experience when you're on that level of athletes. Those are some of the best athletes in the world. And you're talking about the kind of money that people are throwing out there. It becomes a Sodom and Gomorrah. Like 2 Corinthians 6, 14, be not unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what fellowship is light with darkness, what communion has Christ with Belial, and what agreement has the believer with an unbeliever but we are the temple of the living God. And as I would talk to these different athletes, they would say, show me that in the Bible. And so that told me right then and there I had to get out of football. Because at that time, I couldn't find Genesis in the Bible. I didn't know it meant beginnings. But that's what these athletes, well, show it to me. 
If the Bible's your playbook now, where is that? And so I knew I needed to be in a different arena because I needed to know God's playbook, this word. And I needed to know what message you teach. Uh, at that time, of course, all type of people want to debate different things. Some want to talk about instruments. Some want to talk about miracles. Uh, they're still here about the role of women. Some want to talk about speaking in tongues. When you study your Bible, that's not where Jesus started. Amen. Amen. And so I started studying Jesus and watching how he spoke with people. With the woman at the well, he said, can I have a drink of water? That doesn't sound like it's going anywhere. Amen. <laughs> can I have a drink of water? She said, you're a Jew. You're asking me for a drink of water. Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. She wanted to talk about racism. And Jesus wanted to talk about the gospel. He said, if you had known who it was who asked you for a drink, you would ask of him and he would give you living water. Jesus was able to turn conversations and talk with people about what really mattered. Many times they didn't realize it, but he did such. We talked about John 5. He just asked the gentleman, would you like to be made well? I didn't know that he was going to take this paralytic in John 5 and turn him into a preacher. I have a sneaky suspicion in John 5 that paralytic was going to become a minister. You see, he had been at that pool for 38 years. He had been there quite some time. And he was pretty frustrated with people. He said, there's no man to put me in the water. But while I'm on the way, I want to be on the way, somebody else cuts me off. Sounds like our freeways. Jesus didn't ask him about what other people was doing. But he is letting Jesus know where his pain was. And so as Jesus healed him, I have a sneaking suspicion that paralytic was the one that was going to minister to all the other ones because Jesus only healed him. They couldn't say, you don't know what it's like to be out here wanting to get in that water. He'd say, oh, yes, I do. I was out here for 38 years. What happened? And he begins the gospel. In John 9, there's a blind man. And Jesus takes clay, since he can't see, mixes it with his saliva, puts it on his eyes and tell him to go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. John knew Gentiles would be reading this gospel, so he gives us meanings of words. And he came back seeing. And they began to recognize him, and they said, who opened your eyes? He said, the man called Jesus. He said, what did he do to you? So his first point was, he took clay, anointed my eyes, told me to go wash in the pool of Siloam. I went and washed it, now I see. They said, this man's not from God because he doesn't keep the Sabbath. So they called his parents. Is this your son? They said, we know that this is our son. They know they were being threatened. And that he was born blind, but how he now sees, we don't know. Liar, liar, pants on fire. You've had a child that's been born blind from birth, and now he can see, and you don't say as a parent, what happened? I come home with a snicker, my mother make me cut that thing in 11 pieces, because we have to share. I mean, you don't come home with nothing, and my mama don't know where it came from because she wants to know we were stealing. But the scripture tells us his parents said this because the Jews, the Pharisees had already agreed if anyone confessed him as the Christ, they would be put out of the social club. Oh, excuse me. I meant the synagogue. You catch my drift. 
because that's all that fellowship had become was a social club. And we best be careful too that we don't just have white social clubs and black social clubs and Hispanic social clubs. The cross was about us coming together. The cross was not about crossing us up. The cross is supposed to be the thing that gets us over. Those issues of race and gender and education and finance. And we best listen. You think it's getting bad now? It's going to get worse. When we as God's people don't get back to the gospel and live what we preach. The young man that was teaching me the gospel, I knew I wasn't a Christian, but I wasn't going to admit it to a white guy. And then once he started teaching me the gospel, I said, wait, wait, you don't expect me to become a Christian just like that. So he turned over to Acts 16, 25 with the Philippian jailer. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing him. And suddenly it came to heaven, this mighty earthquake. Everyone's chains fell off and all the doors were open. The jailer was aroused out of his sleep, saw the doors open, drew his sword and was about to kill himself because that was a penalty. A Roman guard of prisoners escaped, Acts 12, when Peter was let out of prison, they beheaded all the jailers or soldiers. And the jailer said in Acts 16 and 30, the question of the ages. He said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? The question of the ages. Because if we knocked these doors in this neighborhood, we would not get the same answer from everybody out there. We get different answers. When you go to the Bible, you get the same answer. Amen? He said, believe on the name of the Lord Jesus. You'll be saved, you and all your household. He took them the same hour of the night, washed their stripes. He and all his were baptized immediately. So the gentleman looked at me and he said, how long did it take the jailer? I said, it says there immediately. He said, what's your problem? I said, wait, man, you can't expect me to become a Christian just like that. He said, well, they did. I said, I got to clean my life up. He said, if you could clean your life up, you'd be Jesus. I don't want to talk to this guy no more. Every time I say something, he turns it on me. I said, you, you don't understand. He said, God does. He said, it's God's job to clean you up. It's your job to obey the gospel. So April 26, about 1.30 in the afternoon, I obeyed the gospel. And I began to watch him teach the gospel. Well, I want to talk about, I don't care what subject they brought up. None of them brought up the gospel. Y'all ain't got no music. They meant instruments, but you know how they say it out there. We got music, they got no noise. We won't speak of that right now. Right now we're going to speak of the gospel. Like I said earlier, it's mentioned 101 times in the New Testament. Does it sound like it's important? It's in these letters that they write, that Paul writes. If you have a Bible, let's glance at some of them. I talked to you earlier about Matthew chapter 13 where Jesus said, when his disciples asked, why do you speak to them in parable, parable A, that word parable A, parable, the Greek word, it means alongside of. That we get a story alongside of truth that helps us digest it. Uh, there was a man that had two sons. Well, there's a story that we can relate to. So Jesus used these parables as a story alongside of. But he said it had two purposes. He says, to you has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom, the hidden sacred secret, but to the rest whose hearts were not there, he said, it was not. They would have to study the parables to demonstrate to God you want to know the truth and you will dig and you will search. Wasn't that a book? Muscle and a shovel? Use your own brain and do your own digging. Is what he was trying to mean with that title. We once were, were a culture where we carried our Bibles and studied them. We once were a culture that people said we're Bible toting and Bible quoting. What's happened? Don't think I haven't watched y'all walk through those doors. I'm watching to see who's carrying Bibles. That's what I do as a brother. If my kids get ready to go to school, 
I make sure they got the school books, amen. <laughs> I help them do homework. My wife came to me and said something I hadn't thought of. As you women sometimes are a lot further ahead of us than we know. She said, you need four Bibles. I said, oh, no, one's, one's enough. She said, no, you need four Bibles. I said, tell me why I need four Bibles. She said, I don't want these kids fighting over one Bible when you're not here anymore. She said, I need you to teach out of four Bibles so that these kids can get your notes and different things once you're gone. Each one of them have a Bible. And I'm going, wow, that's good thinking. <laughs> How'd you come up with that? <laughs> and so now I got about 12. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm planning for the grandbabies too. Back in 1991, when we came back to America, Terry Johnson, who happened to be at that time the president of Oklahoma Christian, invited my wife and I for dinner, he and his wife. And we went over, and after dinner, he said, Willie, I want to tell you a story. He said, there's a young lady that was converted by a youth group, and she came to Oklahoma Christian, and just an outstanding young lady. Her parents were agnostic. He said, and the young lady left the youth group at one of the congregations here and went down to OU. And she was going to Quail Springs Mall there in Oklahoma City. And they were six deep in the car and they were hit by a Mack truck. And she was the only one who died. They said her parents showed up at Oklahoma Christian to get her belongings and the boyfriend had come. And they began to fight over her Bible. The boyfriend wanted her Bible. The parents wanted her Bible. He finally relented, and the parents took her Bible. And they would turn in her Bible on every scripture she had marked or underlined. They said, we want to memorize and read it over and over and over, because if this scripture stood out to her, it became a part of her. And if we'll memorize that, we still have a part of her. Brother Terry Johnson said they immersed the father and the mother in the Christ some six weeks later, just by the parents studying all the verses their daughter had marked in her Bible. And so, no, this is not my original Bible. It's just one of the ones I'm breaking in for some relatives. Amen. <laughs> I've got about 15 Bibles on my desk. And so I put different notes in each one because I have a plan. I don't put the same notes in all of them because then they won't talk to each other possibly. But I got different notes and when they get together, they can share what different notes are in different Bibles. And so it will hopefully keep my relatives and grandkids unified that they can share notes in the scripture. I'm not much on listening to the radio these days, so I have gospel songs in all my vehicles. So when my grandkids get in and I'm taking them to school or I'm picking them up or we're riding to the store, we got gospel going. I'm a hard fighting soldier on the battlefield. And so me and my grandbabies go down the road, we're hard fighting soldiers. Then we start singing. Get a right church and let's go home. Get a right church and let's go home. Get a right church. If that light, light turns green, people look over and they think that we smoking something, me and my grandkids. Because <laughs> they all are moving around. Get a right church and let's go home. Now, every time my grandkids jump in the car, they're like, put on granddad's music. <laughs> and everybody knows what granddad's music is. You see, I don't know how long I have with my grandchildren, amen. I don't know how long I have with my children. But I'm going to make sure when I'm around them, I'm either singing about the gospel or I'm talking about the gospel. My son went off to Missouri. He called me up one day and he said, Daddy, Daddy. 
He said, I lost all my gospel songs. Can you send me some gospel songs? And I was like, yes. You don't think that's encouraging. When your son goes off and he calls home, wants me to ship him, not money, amen. <laughs> ship him them gospel songs. Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation. Everyone who believes to the Jew first and also the Greek. There's that word gospel. And I believe that gospel to be the mystery that Jesus came to make known. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Paul writes the church at Corinth. And one of the things I do like about these letters, Paul reminds them of what he taught. And he didn't mind repeating himself. Verse 1 says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Christ Jesus and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not in persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and power. That your faith should not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. However, we speak a wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing. But we speak a wisdom of God in a mystery. There it is again, Mysterion, a hidden sacred secret. The hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For if they had known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has entered into the heart of men the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his Holy Spirit. Amen. For the Spirit searches all things. Yes, the deep things of God. Eleven. But what man knows the things of a man what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Now we've not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is of God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. Amen. God no longer works in mysterious ways among his people. The world might say that, but we don't say that no more. He is making the secret known to us in this gospel. These things, verse 13, we also speak, not in words which men's wisdom teach, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual words. But the natural man does not receive the things of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they're spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, and yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who knows the mind of the Lord, that they may instruct him? For we have the mind of Christ, just like Philippians 2. Paul says in chapter 2, there is a knowledge, a wisdom. That mystery comes up again. Look at Galatians chapter 1, beginning of verse 6. Paul says, if we, an angel from heaven, preach unto you any other gospel other than that which was preached to you, let them be eternally condemned. As I've said before, say I say again, if anyone comes to you and doesn't bring this gospel, let them be eternally condemned, even if it's an angel. It is an unchanging gospel. As Revelation 22, 18 speaks of, is not to be added to or taken away. This is exactly what God wanted us to have and wanted us to make known. 
The gospel is faithful. It will produce. I believe Luke said it this way as Jesus was teaching Matthew 13, Mark 4, and Luke 8 about the seed that was sown on the rocky ground, on the pathway, on the thorny ground, on the good soil. And Luke 8, 11, he says the seed is the word of God. That's what we plant in the fertile hearts of men and women. This gospel, the word of God, and he says it's to be unchanging. It's to be unchanged by man. Look at Colossians chapter 1. I begin about verse 26. Well, let me start at 25. Of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. The mystery, there it is again, which had been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to us to his saints. To them God will to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery, there it is, among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's where we start when we begin to teach people. We start with the gospel. Paul said it is the power of God unto salvation. If the gospel doesn't open the heart, arguing about all these other issues won't either. Because the power is in the gospel. You cut out Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, then that letter would have no power in it. It's about the gospel. The letters were telling people how to work through their problems. The gospel is the power of God under salvation. That's where the power works. That death, burial, and resurrection people begin to understand about the cross. Let me ask you a question. Most people in America have heard about the death of Jesus. Oh yes, he died on the cross for my sins. People know about that particular statement of the gospel. And it is true. Our Lord was sinless. He who knew no sin became sin for us. John 1:29. John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And so many have heard that particular statement. But when you ask the question, as I do, when I contact people, explain to me about the burial. Why doesn't it just say death and resurrection? Why is it death, burial, and resurrection? Well, there's a message there. I didn't know it for some time until I dug into it. I'd really like to know if I had you one-on-one, -on -one, I would ask you to explain the burial to me. Well, you young people look pretty smart. Yeah. Could y'all explain the burial to me? Oh, you could? What did Jesus go when he died? Don't look at him. I saw you hit. Where'd he go? Into the rock. That's where the body goes. I know where the Jesus goes. He went to paradise. Oh, where's that? I hope in a different place. I don't know where. Oh, it doesn't specify.
left to eat. So we are blessed. Amen. And so we get this man's history. He ain't good every day and dressed in purple. Fine linen, hell of the wrong color. And there was a certain beggar that laid at his gate named Lazarus, full of sores, some form of leprosy. Yea, even the dogs came to lick the sores on the cup that he could find. He was begging for the drums that fell from the rich man's table. I look those words up. The beggar wasn't begging for the drums from which the man ate. Like in those days, they didn't have napkins or serviettes. So when they baked bread, they left over the dough, they would bake. And they didn't use silverware. They did the hands. Like my mother did things, like I was baking. They give them fingers. Well, they would take that leftover bread, and that was between the hands of it. The beggar was begging for the crumbs that fell from the loaf in which the man washed his hands. Do we get an idea of what his spirit was like? He was humble. He didn't want the food off the man's plate. He wanted some crumbs off the loaf the man washed his hands with. So we get a look into Lazarus' spirit and attitude. He was humble. What about the rich man? He wouldn't even give me no crumbs. He was a tightwad. He was a scrooge. Yeah, what you say you don't share with nobody? Yeah, if you get a little old, you're going to find out that it's nice to share. Jesus does, amen? <laughs> He's sharing his wealth. It says that it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried into Abraham's bosom. And of course, it's just letting us know that he was in very close proximity with Abraham. This is not a parable. Abraham is a real person. But the rich man died and then Hades, we're there. He lifted up his eyes. Seeing Lazarus afar off, uh, uh, Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. He said, Father Abraham, what grace was the rich man? He's Jew. Come to Abraham, Father. Father Abraham, send Lazarus. He didn't know things had changed. To do the of his leader in water and cool my tongue from an anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember in your lifetime, you had a good. But here, you're in torment. He is comforted. So I know where Abraham is, where Lazarus is, there's comfort. He said, besides this, there's a chasm, a gulf that's fixed between us so that no one can cross over from you to us or from us to you. And so the rich man says, Father Abraham, send Lazarus to my father's house. I've got how many brothers? I got five brothers, or oh, they're coming to this place. This rich man is trying to do evangelism from hell. It won't work. Did you know his brother wasn't in the right before then? Why did he say something? Well, you know what? You might have messed up Christmas. You don't want to mess up them get together holiday. Well, you know what? Mess up Thanksgiving, and then we can't come to what we're arguing about religion. My mother put the shotgun on us when we were debating in our house my eight Jehovah Witness sisters. She said, y'all keep this up. I'll end your life right now. So we finished that Bible study quick. <laughs> we, we couldn't talk about that in her house the way we were going at it. You can't do evangelism from hell. When you know there are those who are not living right, be building relationships and trying to do something about it now. Because you can't die a goat and be raised a sheep. It don't work that way. Amen? And so I know that nobody has died and gone to heaven. So people say, what about him? He was translated and should not see death. Well, he didn't die like normal people did, just like Moses. The Bible says he got buried Moses. But where he's been perfect, Jesus said in John 14, 6, no one comes to God but by me. Are there exceptions for God? I don't think so. You can't get to heaven without the blood of Jesus. Ephesians 1 and verse 7. Well, the Bible in the Old Testament just letting us know these men didn't die normal death, just like Melchizedek. He had a mom and a dad, Adam and Eve did. They're just saying, after the order of Melchizedek, Melchizedek was not from the Levitical tribe. 
And they didn't have a record of Melchizedek's father or mother. But he had them. And so, so many times people think, well, you know, they died and went to heaven. That'd be impossible. You know why you think that went to heaven? Judgment. Christians ain't going to be judged. John 5, 24. Jesus said, whoever believes in me has passed from death to life and will not come into judgment. Are my sins forgiven? Then what's he going to judge me for? Thank you. Because see, the word judge means condemn. Romans 8, verse 1. There is no condemnation to those that are now in Christ Jesus. He's coming to get his bride to wed her. Not the judge. He's already made that judgment. When you love her. I thought there was just so much joy with me to find out. Well, let me explain it another way. How long have you been married to my sister, brother? Did I put you on the spot? Did you know? 47. 47. Hey, you good. You just got out of trouble. <laughs> 47 years. Y'all been celebrating that anniversary? Congratulations. Did you know when you married her, that was a judgment day? It told every other man they couldn't have her. And it told every other woman she can't have me. What you celebrate as a wonderful union, everybody else is a judgment. Hello. <laughs> when Jesus comes back for his bride, it might be condemnation for the ones that don't pay the gospel. Not for the bride. That's the way to do it. Isn't that Matthew 25? Five fools and virgins, five wise virgins. And of course, in Jewish ways, the groom kind of watched over the bride with her bride's name. And in, in every culture, the groom was supposed to try to sneak up on the to be white and see if she was Romeo. Romeo. If, if, if she was longing for him, if, if, if she was just wanting to see him and could wait for that day. That's the way he was trying to find her. And so that's why you read these. And the bridegroom's job was to say, the bridegroom coming, they say, the bridegroom coming, and they come up and start beautifying. Jesus said, John was that guy. Amen. He was making the announcement. I was so relieved. Reading John 5 24, also John 3 again, to know the Christians were the face judgment. That's how way it would be. Matthew 25. Why were the foolish virgins? Foolish. They brought no oil for the lamps. So the foolish ones were judged and not the wise ones. They just did it again. Amen. Matthew 25, I'm reading. It was a wedding day for them, but for the foolish virgins, they were virgins. But they didn't get there on their own merit. Amen. They brought no oil. So for years, I had to try to dig in and study where the wall was. You know where the wall is? Why are you looking at him? You know what the wall is? The what? Oh, no, 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 no. That's not the wall. The wall is, may the work I've done speak for me. It's the work you do in the kingdom. You see, the more you get up here and lead singing and lead prayers and serve the Lord's table and teach Bible classes as y'all grow older, hey, that's got your lamp burning. Keep it burning, burning, burning. Give me all the love to have my pray. Young people told me that years ago. You know that? Yeah, you went to camp with me, something. <laughs> that all is the service we give to the Lord. Well, you know I baptized three people last week. I'll give you one and a half of Can I do that? Well, I went to the hospital and I visited about six folks. I'll give you three of them. Can I get that away? That's why the wise virgins couldn't give the foolish ones none of their all. You can't give service away. So for the wise ones, it was their wedding day. For the foolish ones, it was their condemnation day, judgment. They said, hey, you go what they buy and sell. We don't want our lamps to go out. Let me say it another way. Oh, really, you don't have to go out there talking to me, uh, Jesus. When I quit pro football, oh, brother, what do you can be a Christian and, and still play pro football? Oh, how many do you know? Y'all don't know me? I mean, I had Christians telling me that. You can be a Christian. No, 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 no. I could. I needed to hear it. with the saints. I need to be with my family because I need to grow and learn. 
and I need to make sacrifices, as we all do. And I mean, some of you have to make some sacrifices. Oh, yeah. I saw you didn't need that little, ooh. <laughs> you didn't need that little fish bite, which tells me you've been working at this for a while. This wasn't your first rodeo. I mean, me. Need it. <laughs> it's visible. It's service that we give to the Lord. And so that was a release for me to know I don't have to worry about judgment. I'm a part of the bride of Christ. He's coming to wed his bride. He said, they have Moses and the prophets. That gives us the time frame of when this conversation took place in the spiritual realm. Jesus said, they have Moses and the prophets. He said, no, Father Abraham, if one go to them from the dead, they'll believe. He said, if they will not believe Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded if one is risen from the dead. Well, guess what? Somebody did arise from the dead. What's that done to the world? Just like Jesus said. Yeah. Those whose hearts haven't been filled with this word, the seed of the kingdom, the gospel, won't make any difference. Only place in our New Testament we get a glimpse into the spirit world. Jesus gives us a window. Luke 16, 19 through 31. When the rich man saw there was no hope for him, he thought about his five brothers. Hmm. What are all these rich people like? Well, just look at some of these baseball players and basketball players, professionally. They really get along, don't they? Not. Prima donnas. Yeah. Always in the news for the bad stuff. Just bad news comes out. As I was talking to the young folks yesterday, back in 80, 1980 when I was in Dallas, heard out about a young man named Dennis Rodman. Got arrested at the DFW airport stealing watches. Found out his sisters had played basketball in high school. Two of them made all state, all Americans. He didn't think he would be as good as them, so he never played basketball. But a strange thing happened. After high school, he grew six inches, six foot six. Went to an NAIA school, ended up getting drafted by the Detroit Pistons. John Daly became a father figure to Dennis Rodman. And as long as John Daly was coaching the Detroit Lions, or Detroit Pistons, Dennis Rodman crossed his eyes and dotted his T's. He had a father figure. They fired John Daly, and that Dennis Rodman never existed again. He began to cross-dress. He began to get piercings, if you've seen him lately. He's got more holes in his face than cottage cheese. You see, just like we talked about in Mark 5 or Matthew 19, with the young man whose name NIV was Army, King James will say Legion, there was six to 10,000 soldiers in a Roman legion, so this gentleman had a lot of demonic influences in his life, evil habits that controlled him. Mr. Dennis Rodman is there, as we see with so many of these athletes. All the public will pay billions of dollars to watch him do their craft. Who's talked to Dennis Rodman? Barry Switzer. John you, Bubba Smith, Peyton Manning, Coach Fulmer. My son has been teaching me a few things. I've never really had any heroes outside of Jesus. But because my son had gotten in sports and athletics, I've Take him to the spring game there at OU in April. And we go there, and there's their Heisman Trophy line, Adrian Peterson and Billy Sims and the quarterbacks. And I introduce him to him, and some of his friends come with us, and they're like, can we get your autograph? And so they, all the little boys are getting an autograph, and my little fourth or fifth grader is standing there. And I said, James, don't you want an autograph? He said, no, sir. There's 
Billy Sims, there's Adrian Peterson. There's Tyler, Tyler Murray. He said, no, sir, I don't need autograph. Okay. So on the way out of town, we stopped to get grass, gas, and there's Blaine Griffin, all six foot nine of them. And he's got, got one of the flip phones. My kids didn't get a phone until they were getting ready to go off to college. Uh, I'd love for some of you boys and girls to come stay with me. <laughs> you can forget about a phone and an iPad, hey, man. <laughs> And I said, James, guess who's pumping gas over there? Blake Griffin. And he's got the little thumb game, and he's just kind of playing. He said, yeah, I saw him. Don't you want an autograph? He didn't even look up. No, sir. I said, you don't know who that is. He said, that is Blaine Griffin. I saw him. He went back to his game, never looked up again. I, man. I was hoping to get a picture with Blake Griffin. <laughs> well, I can't do that now myself. I don't even want an autograph. So we got to a quarterback camp out in California. Popular coach out there, George. Well, guess who shows up? Joe Montana and his two sons. Well, I played against Joe, but this is my first time meeting him. And so I look over my son's talking to Joe and his two boys. And so at the end of the day, I said, I bet you don't know who that was. I mean, he's over there talking to him like he's a classmate. They're laughing and slapping each other on the back. I said, I bet you don't know who that is. He said, I don't know who that is. You didn't either. You're over there talking to him like he's just one of your teammates. He said, Dad, that's, that's Joe Montana. You didn't want an autograph? Oh, no, sir. I, I can take a picture. He said, no, sir. I don't need a picture. Well, he's helping me, because I sure would have took one. <laughs> and it's like, kids, don't think you can't teach us parents. We learn from you all, too. It's a two-way street. Jesus said, except you turn and become us. Little children, it's about the gospel. He's talking about being innocent, not being premeditated in our actions. This, this is what the gospel's about. This hidden sacred secret. It keeps us humble. I thank my son for carrying himself in such a manner. They said, James, you must really love football. He said, no, sir. I don't love football. So his coach at Mizzou said, well, why do you play? He said, to be a role model. That's why we put our kids in sports, to be a Christian role model. And so people, coaches knew in our town, when we showed up, we stood for something. We might not have been the best athlete, but we're going to be the fittest one out there. And that's why we were doing them 5,000 jump ropes for some eight years, my son and I. I was soft on my girls. I just, they just did 1,000, five sets of 200 with a minute rest in between. Y'all might have to try that. Really good for you. Because normally when you jump on that rope, ain't nothing shaking but eggs and bacon. Amen? <laughs> it comes right off. I've been learning a lot from my children. I've been learning a lot from this fellowship. We're all teaching each other. Oh, by the way, Barry Switzer's son is a deacon in the church. So don't be too hard on the bootlegger. His son's working on him. Oh, I did baptize Chuck Fairbanks' son and daughter. They fell away, but I'm still working on them. Some 45 years ago. Oh, Jimmy Johnson, the old Dallas cowboy coach, Miami coach, was raised in the church. His wife and his children are still members. Last time I met them, they were in Stillwater. That's my world. So I know what's going on in the sporting world because these are people I'm going to be teaching because that's the world I came out of. Did Paul go back to Pentecost? Did he go back to Jerusalem trying to teach some of those folks? Oh, yes, he did because he knew how they thought. He knew what they believed. But he started at the same place. He started with the gospel. There's so many people out there who think they know what we teach. Hello? Y'all think y'all the only ones going to be in here? Oh, some people try to tell me what they think I believe. You're a Campbellite. 
I said, oh, no, sir. Campbell wouldn't even worship with me. I started at the same place. The gospel. Look at Revelation 5. And we'll get out of my introduction. <laughs> what? <laughs> I told you, I like being with y'all. And so, we want to be together a while. Revelation chapter 5. I begin at verse 1. I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside, on the back, sealed with seven seals. And then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open a scroll and to loosen its seals? Verse 3. And no one in heaven, on the earth, under the earth, was able to open the scroll or to look in it. And he did what we would do. He said, I wept. And I wept much. Because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look in it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Stop weeping. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Seven. Then he came and he took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a heart and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seal, for you were slain. You have redeemed us to God by your blood, out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Ten and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, and the, li the living creatures, and the elders, and the number of them were ten thousand times ten thousand, thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom, and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessed, blessings and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne, to the Lamb forever and ever. Church, I believe that scroll to be what we have in our hands. The gospel. These 27 books. Jesus was worthy to open the throne. No one else was found. And he personally brought it to us. The word became flesh. And he delivered it to his bride. These are his vows that he says to us. The better of the words he still wants you. In sickness or in health. Amen? Until death, no, he don't have that in because death won't bother us no more. Amen? Amen. I mean, that verse in Ephesians chapter 4 rocks my world. Except when Jesus ascended on high, he led captivity captive. What a statement. You won't be nothing like that anywhere else. Jesus, when he ascended on high, he took death, Hades, captive. Because those were the compartments that scared men, that put fear in men and women. And so he says in Revelation 1, 17 and 18, Behold, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. I'm evil that was dead, and will not bear more. Yea, and I have the keys of death and of Hades. Praise God. Satan so don't have it no more. It was taken from him. Because Jesus came out of Hades. He owns that place. He's the firstborn from the dead, God somebody did. That's where he gave Satan a blow to the head. And we already know we're coming out of there because Jesus came out. Amen? Amen? That's what gives this little shy country boy his boldness. 
in Hades called hell. That's what the rich man was. Both are temporary. And that's why Jesus will destroy them both. The last enemy he will destroy is death, meaning separation. We will never again be separated from our Father as Christ is now. Those three days were the longest he had ever been separated from his Father, but never again. And with us, never again either. That's the power of the gospel. That's why we ought to be faithful to the gospel. It tells us how we now defeat that old devil. Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. Our sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose the victor from the dark domain and he lived forever with the saints who reign. He arose! And so this little country boy is bold now. I just ain't scared of nothing. <laughs> I am so thankful that brothers and sisters in, this, in the body of Christ have had me into their home. And I'm learning how to live this gospel with a mate and how to raise my children and asking others for insight. One of the congregations in Madison, Alabama, Church of Christ there, the elders said, telling me they did something I thought was very, very unique. They said, we took a survey in our congregation and we found out that we had three, over 400 years of marriage counselors. When we found out, some have been married 47 years, 72 years, 55 years. So all of the parents who had raised boys, they asked them to write do's and don'ts. And then they would give that to a new couple that just had a son. Hey, Amen. Why are we using all this wisdom sitting here on the bench? That wisdom, so listen, if you put up with that dude for 47 years, tell these young women how. Tell them how, fellas, that you romance your woman. Yeah. Sit with her. You sing my song to her? Okay. She didn't hear that. Okay. She what? She don't like me. If you sing long enough, she'll start like me. <laughs> my wife and I got married, and I didn't realize in those first years you were getting big. She fixes something. <laughs> She's testing it out. And her big thing was noodles and tuna. And the one thing I did not like was noodles and tuna. I need the tuna by itself, but noodles and tuna, I never had that. I didn't say that. I just got me a big bottle of ketchup. <laughs> you young married people, you get to know how. I said, honey, can you pass me that bottle of ketchup? She said, what you going to do with it? I'm drowning whatever this is. <laughs> I want it to be slippery when it go down. I don't want it to get stuck. <laughs> I want to stay married. So whatever mama wants to put in front of me, it's going down. I'm here to tell you, Mr. Hines has made my wife's cooking wonderful. I come home one night and she's from a Bible study and she's just weeping. You know, there's two types of tears. There's a silent kind that just run. And then there's that one where all your inner bowels, you, you can't stop. When I used to babysit my siblings, I'd say, stop all the crying. Well, when all the bowels are participating, you can't. So it's <laughs> I said, what's the matter? What's the matter? I burnt dinner. Oh, we've been married a few months, and oh, she was just so distraught. 
I said, it's okay. No, it's not. I went and got Mr. Hines. And we just whooped that bottle into that whole pot. And I said, she said, oh, you don't have to eat it. I said, if you burn it, I'm going to eat it. Because I found out burnt offerings in him with the Old Testament. Amen. <laughs> Amen, church. I said, I do for better or for worse. When I do weddings, I'm turning the words around. I say, for worse or for better, but that's what comes first. <laughs> the worse. We're still married, amen. Mr. Hines gives some wonderful counsel. He stays slippery. <laughs> I know people tell preachers jokes. I'm telling you the truth. You can call my wife, send a text message. She knows when I sit at the table, Mr. Hines is always with me. Because I'm not a little seven or eight year old. I don't like that. Uh uh. It's going down. We've had some wonderful times around the dinner table. My son's been married almost six years. He and Mr. Hines are good friends. He even, he even brings in Mr. Barbecue. <laughs> So you young guys, pay attention now. That's the very reason. What's that place called? Uh, seafood, fish and chips, and all those, Captain D's. You know why they have secret sauce? Because most of them are selling shark meat. And that's why you got that secret sauce to make it go down and you don't get the taste of it. Don't think they care about your health. What am I getting at? that there's going to be some meal served up by Satan that we're not going to like. But with the blood of Jesus, we, he teaches us how to deal with it because of the blood of Christ, because of the compassion of Christ, because of the forgiveness of Christ. We served up some things to him that wasn't very tasty. People spit in his face. They welded him across the back. He didn't carry the whole cross. You see, the history about the cross is, in Roman culture, if you broke a Roman law, they would put the crossbar and tie your hands to it, ran across your shoulders, and you would walk through town down Main Street. And the tradition was, all the citizens would come out with sticks and leather whips. They would whip you across the back as you went through town to shame you down Main Street. They would punch you. They would kick you. If it hadn't been the whole cross, they couldn't have got to his back. So it's the cross bar that's got him out so that his back is exposed. And the punishment that was divvied out sent a message to the whole community. You break Roman law, this is what you get. But it also had a double meaning. If this person was innocent, the punishment was so severe that the guilty person would confess. <clears throat> And a lot of us saw that happen when Mel Gibson made the movie, The Passion of the Christ. We saw criminals in this country that had escaped, turned themselves in. We had murderers turn themselves in because when they saw that scourging from which nine out of ten men died, they convicted them about their sin and they turned themselves into the law that were even Christians. That's the power of the cross. It was meant to shame. And my Lord did that for me. And I'm sitting around talking about, well, I'm shy. I can't get up in front of people. Not after I studied the cross. I became just like Samuel. Speak, Lord. Your servant is waiting to obey. How do you want me to serve you? Where do you want me to serve you? I will go wherever you want me to serve you. I met a young man on the East Coast. Young white man, brother, white brother and his wife. He had a very prestigious job, had a double figure income, and he had become a Christian. He said, I'm not in the a lot of people. I'm not bringing a lot of people to Christ with this high society job that I have. 
He said, so I quit my job and got about a third of my pay and we moved down into a rundown black Hispanic neighborhood and I began to reach out to these people around me just like Jesus did. He said, we can't leave a toy outside, a bike outside, it'll be gone by morning. He said, but we've moved here to try to minister to these people. Someone has to. You don't think that convicted me that this man, after studying the cross, was willing to alter his life, his family's life, because he wanted to show people Jesus. He wanted to take the gospel to them. No, not everybody has to do that. But isn't it moving when we meet somebody who does? Those individuals who leave the plush of America and they go to mission fields. Sad to say so many of them come back here and they have to beg almost. We have less, we have fewer missionaries today than we've ever had because so many mothers and grandmothers want those sons and grandsons to go chase the dollar, become big executives. I don't know if y'all ever heard of Charles Hodge. He just passed away a few years ago. He was my grandpa. He said, well, one of the reasons we don't have more elders and more evangelists and more missionaries today, he said, grandmas and grandpas aren't planting the seeds in them grandbabies anymore. He said, when I was a boy in the 40s, grandpas and grandmas was telling these boys, I want you to grow up and you'll be an elder in the Lord's kingdom. You'll be a missionary. You'll be an evangelist. Seeds will be implanted. Very seldom do you hear of that today. Just because we live in America, we best be cautious. God's people have always been pulled into the society with which they dwell. And we've been told not to be covetous. And so I wanted to see what my faith was made of when I went to the mission field. Was it strong enough to survive? And in doing such, coming back here, it's been strong enough to survive. I've been in evangelism for 48 years, learning how to start where Jesus started, to just start with the gospel. Can I have a drink of water? Do you want to be made well? He said to the woman in John 8, who stoned you? She said, no one, Lord. He said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. Jesus just told me she had been baptized with John's baptism. That's what his disciples did. How do you know that? You can't go and sin no more if you've never repented and been immersed. There's a word in our English language called synecdoche. S-Y-N-E-C-D-O-C-H-E. It means a part of the whole. Jesus will only mention one. He said, go, your faith has made you well. Well, and repentance a part of faith. Under John's baptism, yep. Yeah, he preached the baptism of repentance. Well, it was baptism a part of faith once John began his ministry? Yep, Luke 7.30. To reject John's baptism was to reject God. John 4 verse 1 says, When therefore the Pharisees heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples, that's why they were with him. He did the teaching, they did the immersing. It took me a while to catch all that. Go and sin no more. Oh yes, she was immersed. So was the blind man. So was the woman at the well. The Bible don't have to tell us, because the Bible tells us that John came preaching a baptism of repentance for remission of sins. Mark 1, 4, Luke 3, 3. That should be enough. Synecto key, a part of the whole. Well, yes, they were immersed. Because that was the commission they were under. John's baptism, as we saw in Acts 19, with those from Ephesus. Did you receive the Holy Spirit? No, we were baptized with John's baptism. It is amazing when you study the scripture how you begin to gain insight. It's truly been a joy to be among you, church. My heart's desire is I wish we could extend this meeting for another month. <laughs> Our world is not that way anymore. And so we do the three-day, four-day meetings because of the way our culture is. 
I, I grew up on the Jetsons, that old space age. Are we there yet? We're there. You go out there on the freeway and do 70, you'll get run over. I mean, people are in a hurry, and they don't realize how fast they're headed to hell. But they are in a hurry. They don't want to be slowed down. So my prayer is, church, that you'll be, be a bit more bold in your walk of faith. You'll be a bit more kind when you run into some of the folks that are out there in darkness, wandering blindly. That you'll be, be a bit more compassionate when you meet or run into some of these men and women, individuals. Doing this for 48 years, I often run into people in unusual places. Back in 1900, and none of your business, a youth minister picked me up in Nashville and we took off for one of the small towns around Tennessee and he wanted to stop by and get some hot dogs for the youth rally. So we went inside and I was just kind of walking around. There's not a friend no like the lowly Jesus. And I glance over and there's a woman staring at me like I robbed a bank. And I know the stairs from over the years. I know the stare that says, you look like you just escaped. <laughs> I know that scare, stare. And then I know the stare is, I know you from somewhere. And she had that stare. So I told the youth minister, I said, uh, I'm going to go wait by the door. And so I went up front, and she began to follow me. And so I didn't know quite what all the stare meant, but I knew she thought she recognized me. And so as she was trying to come around to see my face, I began to turn like I didn't see her. And I finally get a tap on the shoulder and she says, are you Willie Franklin? I said, I am if I'm not in trouble. <laughs> and she began to cry. She said, Brother Willie, I came to all of those youth rallies you used to have in the 70s and 80s. I said, oh, wonderful, sis. Man, I'm so glad that you stayed faithful. She said, I'm not. She said, I married an unbeliever, and he doesn't allow me to come. I said, I'm in town speaking. I'd love for you to come out. And the next day, she was there with her children, just crying her eyes out. I taught a young lady in Papua New Guinea. She got home, and her husband beat her to both her eyes with swollen shut. In Papua New Guinea, a woman is property. Every Sunday, he would lock her in the closet. She was not coming to the fellowship. But he had to go out of town periodically, and after a year, her name was Newa. I nicknamed her Never, Never Give Up. We could always tell when he was out of town, she'd walk in those doors just crying her eyes out. And she would be greeting the saints, and she'd say, you need to realize how valuable this is to be able to come freely here and worship God in this fellowship. I can't do this unless my husband is out of town. Take advantage of this fellowship. Love on one another. Enjoy this. I don't have that opportunity. She made us appreciate this. If you read any missionary reports, you'll find out that this isn't a given. Some places is not allowed. Singing out is not allowed. Preaching out is not allowed. This is a blessing. And church, one of the things that hits me is the saints in this country should be closer than any other saints around the world. But what we learn in mission work is people in Africa or Brazil or Jamaica, they value their fellowship and they want to get together and stay longer. They have materialistically little or nothing, but they have 
Twice the joy we do. Twice the conviction we do. And I wonder, Jesus said, to whom much is given, where is that much that's required from us? Before Thomas B. Warren passed, I used to go and visit him weekly. He was someone I admired for his knowledge of the word. I said, Brother, Brother Thomas B., all the, the war horses are passing away, Guy in Woods, Flavor Nichols, Gus Nichols, um, Brother Wallace, Foy Wallace, Andrew Conley. I start running off names. I said, they're all dying off. I said, where, where are the men going to come from? He said very slowly and gently, he said, I'm looking at one. And I began to cry. I never saw myself in that light, and I still don't. I'm by no means even close to what folks call a scholar. I'm just old country boy, just trying to give the Lord my best shot. But I know there are many who are more talented than I in all the lives that you could touch. My brother, you moved me. If I could take you with me, I sure would. I love your spirit. I love your spirit. You men touch my heart. FH, thank you. Thank you men for your example, for your love. You've even made me want a beard like yours. My mama's Cherokee and it just won't grow like that. The church, you all have touched me. I will never be the same. Thank you for allowing me to fellowship with you for a few days. I am determined to be a better husband. I'm determined to be a better father, a better servant. I'm even going to be a better dishwasher. Don't think we don't watch each other. We do. And you all have touched me this week in ways you'll never know. God bless you. God keep you. God use you till we meet again. It's been a joy to be with you all. If there's prayers you need. It's a study. If it's obeying the gospel, come while we stand and sing. <laughs>